In the name of the glorious Trinity, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Glory be to the everlasting mercies which sent you to us, O Christ, the light of the world and the life of all. Give us wisdom by your law and enlighten our impulses by your knowledge. Sanctify our souls by your truth and grant that we may be obedient to your words and may fulfill your commandments at every hour. O you who enlightens the rational with the knowledge of your greatness, do enlighten, O my Lord, our thoughts, that we may meditate upon your holy and divine scriptures at all times, O Lord of all, Father and Son and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. When receiving a wedding invitation, and we all do, uh, the famous Assyrians' weddings, especially the, the outpour after the Great Lent, there are generally two reactions. It's, oh, wow, how nice, or it's, it's oh, no, not another one. And we start thinking dollar signs, right? But when we riponde, or is it riponde, s'il vous plaît, it's French for please respond. When we ripond, um, it's then clothes shopping time. Um, you know, especially my dear sisters, not content with the 105 that were, you know dresses we have in the in the wardrobe or the closet, um, we go out and we go clothes shopping, shoes shopping because we have a wedding coming up. But as for men, a new tie or a shirt basically does it right. Convenient contentment. I think contentment and convenience came about when men was created, right. But that's not going to be our discussion today. We're going to have a look at a wedding feast in the Holy Scriptures. Jesus tells a parable or a story of a wedding feast. And in this wedding feast, there is one guest who's not properly attired. He did not have, he did not have on wedding clothes. And this is in Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 to 14. And here, unlike... Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 35, which is another story of a wedding uh, feast. In Matthew, uh, the, the marriage feast or the wedding feast, and the, it represents the church. The church as, uh, at the present time. As opposed to Luke um, in chapter 14, which is the end time wedding feast. Let me read it to you. And Jesus answered again, and this is Matthew chapter 22, verses 11 to 14. And Jesus answered again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a marriage feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants and said, Tell those who are invited, Behold, my supper is ready. That's the Holy Eucharist. My supper is ready, and my oxen and fattened are killed as Christ himself. And everything is prepared. Come to the marriage feast. Come to church on Sundays, basically. But they sneered at it and went away, one to his field, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants and mocked them and killed them. When the king heard, when the king heard it, he was angry. And he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, Now the marriage feast is ready, and those who are invited were unworthy. Go therefore to the main roads, the crossroads. Go therefore to the main roads, and whomever you may find, invite them to the marriage feast. So the servants went out to the roads and gathered together everyone they could find, bad and good, and the banqueting house was filled with guests. So everyone was invited to the church. When the king entered to see the guests, he saw there a man who was not wearing wedding garments. And he said to him, my friend, how did you enter here when you do not have wedding garments? And I love this. He was speechless. He couldn't say anything. Then the king said to the servants, bind his hands and his feet and take him out into darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's stop. Oh, for many are called 
and a few are chosen. So basically, that's the story behind what we're going to speak about today. Again, this is the present church we're talking about. And in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 35, if you want to read it, there is a dinner representing the final and eternal banquet. Two things that catch my mind and we'll discuss amongst others is, number one, the wedding clothes. What are these wedding clothes? And the speechlessness of the guest. What is meant by the wedding garments? If we say it's baptism or faith, the question is, is there anyone who can enter the marriage feast without them? Can anyone be a member of the flock of the church without believing and being baptized? You know, a person is outside of the church because he or she has not come to believe in Jesus Christ and to be baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, which is also referred to as the baptism of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, we read, Whoever believes and is baptized has life, and whoever does not believe is condemned. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 27, St. Paul writes, For you are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, For those who have been baptized in the name of Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Aramean. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus Christ. So if you belong to Christ, then you are descendants of Abraham and his heirs according to his promise. So we can't say it's talking about baptism or faith because this guest would not be in the wedding feast. In the church. What then must we understand by the wedding garment? What can it be except one of the father's rights is love? You see, the guest enters the marriage feast but without wearing a wedding garment. Though one may be present in the holy church, he may have faith, He may be baptized, but he does not have love. That's what Christ is talking about. Why love? Why not other things? Why is it that the the garment is likened to love or signifying love? Because that is what our creator himself possessed when he came to the marriage feast. You know, Christ came down. Christ came down from heaven. The father had a bride prepared for the bridegroom. And the bride was a dreadful, stinking, stenchful bride, which was us. And he took that bride, as St. Paul writes in Ephesians, he took that bride, he took the church, and he cleansed it, he washed it with his blood, and he made it clean. See, there is a marriage feast there. And what? What drove Jesus to come down? What drove God, the Word, God incarnate, to take flesh and come down and take the church for himself but love? You see, it was only God's love that brought it about that his son, his only begotten son, united the hearts of his chosen to himself, his chosen which are in his church. John says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. God so loved the world that he betrothed us to his son, his or our heavenly bridegroom. And we being the church, the bride. So being in the church, beloved, entails not only faith and baptism and donation and being committed and helping in the church and etc. But most importantly, love. See, there are many in the church. There may be many in the church, again, believing, baptized, helping, donating, you know, arms giving, but lacking love. And that's the garment that Christ is looking for within his church. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says to his disciples, and remember, we are the disciples of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus disciplined his disciples. 
He taught his disciples. He empowered them with knowledge. And they went out into the four regions of the world and empowered us who are their disciples. So John chapter 13 verse 35 is not only to the direct disciples of Jesus Christ, but also to us who are the disciples of the disciples of Jesus Christ, which makes us immediately or directly also the disciples of Christ because we adhere to his teaching and his discipline. He says, by this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. So the garment, the most important garment, and Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 13, the most important garment is not just faith and obedience. The greatest is love. Because when there is love for God, beloved, remember we spoke about this in one of the episodes when we spoke about why we pray. It's not just entering the presence of the Lord. It's not just speaking with the Lord, communicating with the Lord, having time for ourselves with the Lord. But when we pray to the Lord, it's that we love the Lord and we want to speak to the Lord out of our love to the Lord. So love is the garment, beloved. Now in verse 22, we read that it was the master of the house that came to the wedding feast and looked at the guests and he examined the guests. So it wasn't the servants. The servants let anyone in, right? Who are the servants, beloved? The servants are the church leaders. The servants are the stewards in the church. You know, we are posed many questions and one of them is, Rabbi, do you think that all those people that come to church are worthy? Do you think that all those people who come to church, who are in the church, are holy and pleasing? Are all good people? And our reply is, no, of course not. Me the first of the worst, <laughs> The first of the worst. That's why I attend church. Yes, I have an obligation as a priest. and My brother priests have the obligation to serve the altar, to be the soul of Jesus Christ. But hey, I'm also there. The priest is also at the altar kneeling with a silent prayers and beating his breast or beating his forehead and saying, me also, O oh my Lord, me also, O oh my Lord, I also, O oh my Lord, who are wicked and are not worthy to be standing at this place. Yes, those who attend may not be worthy, may not have the, the right, the meat, wedding feast, clothing. But that's not yours and I, beloved. That's not yours and mine to judge. Now, though the servants, again, being the church, through her authority, vested by Christ through the Holy Spirit, through her canons and laws and liturgy, when the church knows that there is one guest in the church that is not equipped with the wedding feast clothing, which is love what we're talking about, knows that there is a discrepancy, well then the church, by the authority vested to her through Jesus Christ, has the authority to reprimand and to apprehend. But we don't stand at the door and make sure that every person has love in their hearts. We don't stand at the door and make sure that every person, the night before coming to church and to draw near to the, the, the holy mysteries and to celebrate and honor Jesus Christ through the mysteries, have a befitting. We don't do that. We allow that to the master of the feast. But again, in the event when we know that there is a person that is a guest of the church or a member of the flock of the church who is living a life contrary to the commandments and the holiness that God has called us to, yes, the church has the authority to reprimand and to apprehend. So now we know the, the clothing, the wedding clothes, we are likening, likening it to love 
and we know that it is the master who will examine the clothes. We can't read hearts. We are not examiners of hearts and minds. No, God is. Then the second point we read is that when the master comes and looks at all the guests, he didn't come and have a vendetta against one guest. No, no, no. He looks at all the guests and he finds one that does not have the right wedding clothes. And look at what he says. And he said to him, my friend, didn't call him my son. He calls him my friend. How did you enter here? How is it that the servants couldn't see? How is it that you have made it here? How is it that you can be here and not be properly attired? How can we be a part of a church, which is the body of Christ, which is the bride of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the heavenly bridegroom? How can we claim to be uh, uh, members of this holy body but not be possessed in love? How can we stand in a feast of love offering in a feast where the love of God is continuously echoed through the liturgy, through the prayers. When we stand before the Lord and we say, O oh Lord, I am not worthy. In truth, O oh my Lord, I am not worthy. We stand before the Lord and five times we say, Lord, absolve the sins and transgressions of your servants. Five times. We stand before the Lord and we proclaim and we confess that we are sinners and we are beseeching, pleading your gracious gift of forgiveness which came through your love. We ask for that love, but then that love is not within us. We're not attired with love. It's just, just like when Jesus says, if you ask God to forgive your sins, let me paraphrase it, and you haven't forgiven the sins of your brother, well, don't expect God to forgive your sins. He was speechless. Of course. You know, many people think we'll be standing before the, before the, 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 the gracious and, well, the, the righteous tribunal and judgment seat of the Lord. And there's going to be conversation. There's going to be going back. Yes, Lord, but if, Lord, but no, Lord, but this is why, Lord. You know, we're going to have our, our prosecutor and our defense and we're going to present our case. They're going to fight for our case before the judge. No, we will be speechless speechless. You know why he was speechless? Because the one who posed the question to him, the master, who is Jesus Christ, is one who the servant could not give a, deception, a deceitful reply. How would he justify? How could he justify, beloved? How can we justify when there is no love in our hearts, when we are not vested with the garment of love as members of this wedding feast, which is the church? Now, love, I don't want to go too much into that. We need to really have a look at love according to 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, love is not lovey-dovey love. It's not one of those fake loves. Love must be genuine. Love must, be, must possess the quality to the point where you can rebuke someone. You can rebuke a brother and a sister in love. Love must possess that quality where you receive a loving admonishment and rebuking. This is the love that we need to be possessing. Love for those who are suffering. Love, compassion, kindness, mercifulness to those who have erred, who have caused us heartaches and problems. Love for those who beseech for love. That is the garment that we need to be dressed with, beloved, when we are in the wedding feast, in the church. We must possess this garment. You see, St. Paul writes in 3 Galatians, for those who have been baptized, they have been clothed with Christ. Christ is love. Christ is love, praise and glory be to his name. So if I've been clothed with love, clothed with Christ, 
I must be clothed with love. But sometimes when we take our sight of Christ, when we, when we want our own answers, we want our own way of dealing with issues and circumstances and problems, then we give away Christ, we look away from Christ, then we've looked away from love as well. You cannot, we cannot deceive Christ, beloved. You could be at church on a Sunday. You could be wearing your headscarf, kneeling before the Lord, beasting, beating on the breast. And you could be seen by others as how humble and how loving and how... Um, Know, how obedient you are to the Lord, but there may be no love in our hearts. That happens when we exit the church and we see someone who in high school we had a biff with because she took away my boyfriend <laughs> or or she's been texting, she, she was being uh, unfaithful to me and, and she's hurt me or him or her, by the way and we turn our backs on them and walk out, well then, today we learn that Christ is telling you and I that you're not clothed with the proper garment to be in the church. Now, I'm not saying go away and leave. No. We need to change those garments. We need to walk away, get changed, and come back to the flock as well. Because look at what the Master did, beloved. But before we go there, before we, go there we cannot deceive Christ. We cannot deceive Christ. We cannot deceive the Holy Spirit. We cannot deceive the church doctrines and the canons and the liturgy and the Holy Scriptures. We cannot deceive. We will be seen. We will be purged. And we are purged each time we are at church. The Holy Spirit is, is present. Christ is present through the Word, through the Spirit, through the Eucharist. God is there searching our hearts Again, we have been invited. We are a part of that uh, bridegroom through our faith and baptism. But are we attired appropriately? What can we say to justify our lovelessness? What can we say to Christ to justify our unrighteousness? What can we say? What excuse can we give for our unholiness immorality, nothing. We will have to be speechless. The only thing we can do is, you know, we do that. My lips are sealed. Allow me to change my garments. Help me to change my garments. And the, and the master commands the servants, bind his hands and his feet, meaning put him in check. See, we are put in check, beloved, when our garments are not appropriate for the church, when we lack love, compassion, mercifulness, we are held accountable. See, the accountability that we have been held by is the same as being bound. What we need to do is we need to, again, change those garments because we are held accountable, according to the parable. And the outer darkness that Jesus or the master is commanding his servants to take out that guest. One of the fathers writes very, very nicely, the outer darkness speaks of those things far removed from divine virtue and glory. When there is no love in our hearts, we have forfeited ourselves from divine virtues. So being a guest in the church, the bride, the body of Christ, and we are properly attired with love, righteousness, morality, etc. Then we will not be bound by the contrary to what I just said. We will not be bound. And we will not be forfeiting the glory and the virtues because the good virtues come from the overflowing of love that is in our hearts. Number one, for God for others, and for self as well. And when we possess the correct wedding feast garments and the Master Christ who is always purging 
and examining. Then we will be approved. And if we remain, then we will go to the other wedding feast in Luke chapter 14, which is the end time feast. Then we will be reclining, as the Lord says, and he will serve us. And what more do we want as service than to be in the presence of the Lord in eternity? Praise and glory be to his holy name, now and at all times and forever. Amen. this week's message please don't forget to rate and review this podcast and share with your friends and family for any future topic suggestions or to give us detailed feedback please visit our link in the show notes linktr.ee forward slash double-edged sword until next time god bless you all